Hello, everybody. Welcome to GM Joel's Chess Week Recap on ICC. This week, I'll have the story from the World Junior Championships. But first, let's wrap up the, the Palma de Mallorca Grand Prix. In a tightly packed field, Levan Oronian made his move early and coasted to a share of first place with five and a half out of nine. Dmitry Yakovenko made his move late and joined him on that score. But the tournament winners were really a secondary story to the overall points race in the Grand Prix, which would determine the final two spots in the candidates tournament, which will ultimately provide one player uh, a match for the world title with Magnus Carlsen. Mama Jarov and Grishuk watched from the metaphorical clubhouse while their closest pursuers, Maxime Vashe Lagrav and Tamor Rajabov, tried to climb high enough in the cross table to overtake them. They were the only two players in this tournament that had a chance to, uh, to qualify for the candidates. Now, MVL saw his hopes dashed in the last round when his desperate attempt to break down Yakovenko's defenses rebounded against him. It was the Frenchman's first loss and dropped him not only to the middle of the pack uh, in the tournament, but to sixth place in the overall standings. Now, in fairness, he hadn't done much in Palmer. He had won a game early, had a lot of draws. But uh, after coming so close to qualifying from the World Cup, it's a bitter pill for MVL. He uh, made it to semifinals and lost to Aronian, the ultimate uh, winner there, and also is very close on rating and very close to making it from the Grand Prix. Uh, he did not get the um, uh, the wild card spot, which went to Kramnik. So everything but for MVL. Uh, I know he's he's a big fan favorite. I know a lot of, I think a lot of people would like to see him in the candidates, but he'll have to wait until next time. Now Rajabov, on the other hand, he had a whirlwind tournament uh, up and down. He nearly pulled off a miracle after absorbing loss to Tomaszewski in the sixth round. Rajabov needed to finish with three straight wins to make the candidates. And uh, he nearly made it. First, he took care of Li Chao in round seven. And then he showed his resourcefulness in the eighth round against Boris Gelfand. Okay, now we're going to take a look at a game, Gelfand against Rajabov. This is eighth round. Uh, Gelfand has not had a great tournament by any means. He's, I think he's won a game or two, but he's also lost a lot of them. You know, he's he's not... Not what he was. He even fell under 2,700, uh, I think, at some point during this event. Uh, maybe he even finished under 2,700. I'm not sure. But anyway, this was a an old school uh, Queens Indian. No Kings Indian in this big game because Gelfand has beaten his share that opening. And Bishop D2, here White is willing to give up the Bishop pair for a space advantage. I don't think Rajabov minds that type of transaction too much. And we see the center getting blocked, as it often does in this type of position. And then it's all about the pawn breaks. There are natural pawn breaks on both sides for both players. And so black gets ready for F5. Uh, B5, I was actually meant B5, but also F5, so everybody breaks on the king's side. And now black gets in B5. And A5, okay, this pawn uh, is ultimately doomed, but it prevents the knight from going to B6. So Gelfand is prepared to sacrifice that to get going on the king's side. All right, so Rajabov grabs that pawn. But white gets a lot of counterplay. And after this move, bishop h3, okay, the bishop on e7, uh, white couldn't win the bishop on e7 because the knight on d3 was hanging. But now white is threatening to win that. And if black plays a routine move like bishop takes h3, queen h3, white has a lot of play and, in fact, has the advantage. This, there's really only one move in this position. Rajabov had to start getting resourceful here. And his knight takes d5 as played. 
and after pawn takes comes bishop takes g5. Now there's two possible captures here. He did not play fg5. If he had, you can see rook e4, queen g3, stay on the g5 pawn, rook takes e1, knight takes e1, bishop h3, rook f8, and now take with the king. So black gets this pawn on g5, which means he's okay. Um, but I think that the, there's a high likelihood of this, this game ending in a draw. Black has certainly enough pawns, but I, I, I don't think enough pawns for the piece to win the game. Of course, you know, for Gelfand, uh, I, I would think at this point he was thinking about winning the game, but objectively Black is, is doing okay here. Bishop f5, so he gives us this check on e6. So he's looking to keep some pieces on the board. King h1, and now rook a2, all right, obviously threatening mate. Queen e7, I don't know if that was really the best thing to do because uh, when the queens go off, it seems that really the black has better practical chances. So queen e4 might have been a better try. Then, of course, queen d2, threatening mates and stuff. But white can start giving checks. Queen e7, uh, black could back up and accept a pretzel check, but let's say it goes forward. Queen h4, rook h5, queen back to f2, and queen takes f2, knight takes f2. I don't know if this is all that easy to work out, but the, now the knight comes comes charging in. King has to go to g5 or probably gets made in knight f6, and that provides a, a lot of play uh, with the knight and, and, and the rooks and uh, enough for equality but of course white doesn't have any pawns to win with so the way that um that gelfand played actually made the most sense from the point of view of trying to win the game and it was kind of like well he might have won the game if he didn't lose it but it becomes a question of, of um you know how dangerous do those black pawns get um you know if white had a bishop it'd probably be a very different story but the knight with you know where it is it's, it's it can't really get stuck in a foothold and so the pawns become very dangerous um now uh, i suppose gelfand probably had some safer ways to play it he he starts going after the pawns with the rook on the king side and he, he's hoping to take those pawns off very quickly but the knight goes over to f4 and and actually now white is in trouble because the pawns are too strong now it it might seem like two pass pawns and white has two pieces. So why can't he just use the two pieces to stop the two pawns? But strangely enough, he's not able to do it. Okay, first he ties down the rook. So that rook is it belongs to that A pawn. And that just pushes the C pawn. And it doesn't look like it at first, but it's actually a lost position for white. I mean, at first it might seem like, well, the knight sacrifices for the C pawn, the, the rook takes the A pawn, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that black has the idea to just attack the knight with the rook and queen the C pawn. There's actually nothing white can do about that simple plan. So if king F2, king F2 has played, the problem is the board is too long. <laughs> if the board were just a little bit shorter, white would be okay, but rook H1... Getting ready to take h2 and chop the knight. White just doesn't have any defense. Um, if the king goes to uh, e3, um, black could actually still could actually still take the pawn because if if the knight moves, then rook h3 check wins the rook. So, uh, oh, maybe rook a7 check and knight c1. Okay, so so probably black should just play rook e1 and then. And then take the knight, and it's um, you know just a, a winning endgame for Black. So that's a tough loss for Gelfand, and uh, but you know it really shows that uh, Rajabov is is, is a, a very tough fighter, very resourceful player, and you know that ending almost looked like it should have maybe been something for White, but ended up being a win for Black. Um, so. There was uh, two for two, but then he needed to win one more. And in the ninth round, he could no, make um, no headway against a suddenly solid Richard Report. 
um, and he conceded a draw fairly early. Uh, he did stay, um, you know, in a tie for third in the in the in the event and fin- and third place um, overall in the in the Grand Prix. Uh, but uh, he does not make it to the to the candidates. So Mama Jarv and Grishuk get the two Grand Prix seeds for the candidates, and they will join World Championship loser Karyakin. World Cup winners Aronian and Ding, or the winner and the and the runner-up. Rating seeds Carolina and So, USA, USA, and Vladimir Kramnik, who gets the the organizer's choice or the wild card. Slightly controversial. Obviously, he's a very div, uh, deserving player, but you can certainly make a case for for MVL and maybe some other players as well. Uh, to, to get that coveted spot. I want to just show a game between Elyanov and Hammer. Um, it had little to do with the top places, but it kind of had a cute finish that I think our viewers might relate to. So we'll do Elyanov Hammer next. Okay. So this is interesting opening. Um, Elyanov is normally a D4 player. He plays into a Karakan. And then he seems to do, to seem very innocuous. But after a couple of moves, you see like, oh yeah, now I get it. It's one of those bishop f4 thingies uh, in queen pawn opening. And you imagine if black had played c5, e3, cd4, ed4, you can get the same position. So this is sort of like more like a, a queen pawn opening, it, but it's, it's the same structure as an exchange caracan. It actually started as an exchange caracan. Um, now black could simply play queen c8 and defend the pawn. Like I said, it, it, it's um, it's an exchange caracan. I mean, that's it's base bishop d3. Let's say would be a direct transposition. And yeah, maybe white could try bishop b5. That would be a difference. Normally, white commits the bishop early. Um, but um, Hamad decided to sacrifice the pawn, bishop d6, and he takes. The problem is he can take right away. He doesn't have to take on d6, so he saves a little time with his attack on the knight on c6, and now he saves his bishop. So black has to, has to deal with the attack on the knight, and that loses a little time. The rook would really rather go to the b-file. Possibly knight e7 was an option. And now, in order to get things going, he takes on, on g3, Opens up the H file and plays Queen D6. Uh, if he was going to do that, maybe he should have taken the move earlier and then played Queen D6. Um, maybe that could have saved a tempo. Maybe Bishop B5 would have happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it could have been some problems with that as well. But he does kind of lose the tempo, getting the rook to the B file. Queen A6. I think a lot of people would run back Queen B3, but Alyanov does this a slightly more complicated way, trying to, I guess, tie black up a little bit with the pin, although the pin doesn't last. And now E5 to try to get counterplay on the king in the center. But uh, that counterplay is mitigated a little bit by the fact that the rook on, on H1 is active, so it, that, that can, can have some effect on the game. Um, after king... Uh, F1. Um, here, uh, Hammer probably should play Bishop F5 to neutralize that Bishop, and he has compensation for a pawn, no question, because white White's rooks are not connected and Black's pieces are active. Uh, you know, if the Queens went off, it would be a completely different story. But Black has initiative. He didn't play Bishop F5. He played eight, uh, rook e8, which was a little surprising because he allowed bishop h7. Um, hard to believe that he would have missed that, but I'm not sure why he gives this pawn, especially because now black, uh, white has some threats on the h-file, not enough to really get a mating attack, but kind of enough to maybe distract uh, white at uh, a black's uh, counterplay at some point. So rook came over, knight d4, knight g5, King G1 moving to safety. Well, basically, white is consolidating this position with two extra pawns, but not so fast. Hammer throws in, rook takes F2, going for a Hammer blow, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't quite work. King takes, queen E3 check, king F1, knight E4. Okay, 
Looks like it's all over because Black has murderous threats, not just Queen F2, but Knight D2. That's two main ones. Plus on top of that, Knight takes G3, a whole family of, uh, of threats there. So it looks like Knight E4 is a crushing move. Uh, you know, probably by now, Hamo got to the position he realized it wasn't working. But uh, now Elyanov delivered the bad news. Queen G7. And, okay, nice move. Kind of stock, but the, of course the idea is King takes Queen. Now comes a Knight Fork, and he takes the Queen, and White emerges ahead uh, a Rook or more. So, uh, so Black resigned after Queen G7. Not a not a very lucky tournament for for Hammer. Uh, trying to make it a particularly big week for Norwegian chess. A little bit more on that in a moment, uh, but uh, Elyanov wins that game. Okay, now Norway has another world champion with uh, Arian Tari taking the title on tie breaks over Armenian. Manuel Petrosian, that surname keeps producing grandmasters from uh, Armenia, uh, and Indian grandmaster Aravind at eight and a half out of 11. Tari winning tie breaks, of course. Um, now, he scored one of his biggest wins over second seed Grigori uh, Operin in round eight in a, short but, uh, sh- in a sharp but short struggle. That game up next. Okay, now Operin, you know, he's one of those, you know, talented young players that uh, we probably still don't really know that much about. But judging from this game, he seems to be a very sharp player. And uh, Tari was kind of like, okay, bring it on. Uh, the Norwegian, of course, was the, the uh, number five seed in the in the tournament. I mean, the average rating in the whole tournament was was something like twenty three thirty. And when I played, of course, you know, we're talking about 35 years ago, but um, the, uh, there were only a handful of players that even had ratings in the World Junior. So it's, it's really quite a change. All right, so Bishop G, with G4, a very aggressive move. In the old days, Black would just play, retreat the bishop to D7 and say, okay, what are you, how are you going to follow up the pawn on G4? Nowadays, a lot of people say, okay, do your worst, play E6. I think Black is best off as as Tari plays. You don't really want a pawn in e6. It's just clogging your development. So make him take it, and then you have a chance to free your position. Now, I think that more often than not, White plays knight f3 to get the, uh, the pieces out. Uh, but um, uh, Oberyn plays f4, very aggressive, really trying to clamp down on e5 but at the cost of not developing the pieces that quickly. And with bishop h3, he defends the g4 pawn, so he's getting ready to play knight f3. And, okay, if, if it's one of those positions where if black does not react, uh, he's, he's going to be done in a, in a few moves. The, the clamp will set in. But here, Tari makes a very interesting pawn sacrifice, g5, to, to break that clamp. White can take it, of course, but knight e4, and now black is no longer restrained in the center. That His bishop can develop, and he can play for e5. So for a while, Perrine plays okay, knight e2. Castles, this is okay. Bishop b3 is okay, knight b6. Bishop f4 is not really okay. Um, I think what he should do is he should play b3 to keep that knight on b6. Keep that uh, out of the game for a while, and then Black could, let's say, take on c3 and play e5, so he gets this free move in. But it doesn't do that mu- all that much. You know, White could play something like queen d2, hold the line, and okay, Black has has compensation. It's a, it's even a double pawn. White is up, uh, but um, White is holding the line and is perhaps a little bit better. But um, Oprine actually makes kind of a mess of this. Uh, Bishop f4 attacking the queen. Um, well, I, you know, I guess if black didn't throw a knight takes c3, that could be a very effective move. But knight takes c3 and e5 is coming. And he took with the pawn, strengthens the center, but 
now a knight is going to jump into c4. So I'm not really sure where he was, uh, what he was thinking with that sequence because it, the position is really kind of turned in black's favor. Rook f5. And he has an idea to sacrifice in exchange on that square. And if the pawn recaptures an f5 white, you know, is ready to go f6, and those pawns can be be very active. But but black can you know kind of take it as he as he likes. He doesn't take it right away, and he doesn't. He just gets out of the pin. And now black just has lots of lots of threats, lots of activity. And position goes down very quick for white queen e3. And now he takes the exchange because he has this nice follow-up queen g5. It's a very nice pawn to take. And really already white is, you can see the writing on the wall, knight f4, rook e8. He t unpins, knight g6, a cute little move, nice aesthetic move, attacking the queen and the knight. And so the knight comes in and... Now, a nice-looking move, too, knight f4. Not complicated tactics, but very cute. Attacking the queen. Bishop is pinned. Knight is pinned. So he moves queen g4, and now black happily gets rid of that bishop with check and then simply takes an f5 and emerges with a huge material advantage. And that's 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 all she wrote. Operine resigned. So big win for, for Tari. I think he... Uh, held a draw against Jordan Van Forest, who was a top seed in the last round. They did liquidate into a pawn ending, but it didn't look like a, a, an exciting pawn ending. So uh, I, I'm not presenting that that game to you. So congratulations to Norwegian uh, Ariane Tari. Now the World Junior, it's chock full of 2,500 players with even a few over the 2,600 mark. Uh, as as I alluded to, it's it's uh, mind-boggling for me as someone who used to play in the World Junior C just how many really good players are there. And it's, it's easy to take these guys who are to various degrees established grandmasters for granted. But then you consider the Indian wunderkind, Pragnananda. Of course, as he hits it big, we have to keep getting used to saying Pragnananda, which is a tongue twister and a, a very long name. And he's, you know... He's like Madonna. He's basically going to go by one name. That's your name's that long. You don't really need another name. His initial is R, whatever for what it's worth. He was trying to win this title at the tender age of 12. Wow. Now he got pretty close to doing it too. He finished with an impressive eight points, not far off the lead. Most of his wins were pretty technical. He seems kind of inspired by Magnus Carlsen's brand of chess. Very precise, not necessarily all that exciting. He knocked off the tournament's top seed, the aforementioned Van Forest, uh, his, um, whose brother was also playing in this event, by the way. And American representative A. Wander Liang. Now, A. Wander uh, faded to seven points in the end. He lost the last round. He was in the thick of things for most of the tournament. He did very respect respectably. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Pragnananda was winning those games with that kind of technical style. But I want to show a game where he was forced to mix it up and managed to come out on top. So I guess he can play that kind of game as well. So that we'll see that one next. Sunalduth against Pragnananda. Okay, so we got Sunalduth against Pragnananda. Uh, you know, these a lot of these Indian names are tongue twisters, you know, we got spoiled, I guess, with Anand, although Viswanathan is, oh, that's not even that bad, but but some of these names are getting progressively more difficult. It makes me uh, want to just uh, be able to talk about games between Russians. But anyway, this game is a Spanish, Roy Lopez, and it gets very sharp because White goes for the Bishop G5, and he hangs onto the pin. So black accepts the challenge with g5, and now a sacrifice. And this this sacrifice is um, is somewhat known, and well, it leads to real great complications. Bishop g5, e takes d4. Now, in practice, uh, I think bishop d5 has been played most often, and it um, 
well, the computer says that maybe it should lead to equality, but uh, maybe, I don't know, I think it's not so easy, necessarily so easy for black. You have to be very well prepared. Um, there was one game that went like this, D3, okay, trying to keep the third rank closed, and then the knight out, queen F3, king G7, knight D2. And now if rook B8 to defend the bishop, if black plays knight E5, well, I can trade everything on F6 and take on B7. So if rook B8 defending, then comes E5, knight takes E5, rook takes E5, pawn takes E5, bishop takes B7. And this led to a better position for white with the with the minor pieces and the exposed black king. A game Perez Panza against Crisa from Asuncion in 2015. Well, white has a new idea. C takes D4. And at first it looks strange because black can recapture and activate one of his pieces. Arguably it should be the bishop. I'm not sure what he had in mind there. Uh, maybe then he just wanted to develop the knight. But after knight takes d4, now he goes bishop d5. And at first, it looks like, what is he doing? Like black could just play c6, but then comes rook a3. And in fact, after rook, rook a3, uh, the complications really just start. Uh, according to the computer, if c takes d4, then the rook comes at g3, and white has an advantage. Um, and there were a few lines that zeroed out. Uh, I think King G7 was one of them. It's very, very complicated. And who knows, maybe we'll see this uh, in, in a real game. But uh, Pragnananda, I don't know, I guess he smelled a rat and he played 96, uh, you know, just trying to cool things off. And uh, after that move, uh, the computer suggests that white should take on b7 and then take on b5 and just kind of uh, you know little normalize the material situation uh just you know get some compensation maybe black will play a5 and white can take take the rook and just you know have a bunch of pawns and, and a rook for a couple of minor pieces um but of course you know you know i mean that's probably equal when you when you play this line, especially if you have a new idea, you know you want to checkmate the guy. So so he played uh, bishop h4, but now in this variation, black is in better shape to take because after rook check he can interpose the knight. So clever defense by Pragnananda, and here is where the game got away from white. He kind of played the idea in a little bit the wrong way. He needed to play queen f3 attack the knight, and then after bishop d4, only now e5. And it looks strong, but remember, white sacrificed a lot of pieces. So black can play knight e4. And in fact, taking the queen is not going to really work out that well because black has so many pieces in compensation. So what white should do really is to sacrifice to open up the, the black king and bishop f6, but black can just take it. Queen takes, king moves, and white has perpetual check, but nothing more because black has just too many pieces for the queen. So there was that drawing line, which maybe he even saw and rejected. But the move e5, okay, with the idea of pawn takes, pawn, queen f3, from his bishop f2. And this is a winning shot. Queen b6, he gets out with check. And now, actually, okay, Pragnanda really gr grinded this one out. He probably could have won this a lot sooner. Um, he could play, for instance, here, knight h7. Here, maybe a little bit of passive defense might be might be a good idea, f6. And then he can block the g file with knight g5, which, by the way, he can't really take it because he'd open up the f file against his queen and king. So this would be the biggest win for black, really, you know, he just defended a couple of moves, but he, he played the active move knight e4, and this allows white to play queen f6, and he gets to take to take the knight, so he's going to be down in exchange with some counterplay, so he was able to drag it on, and black's technique was not really the best, I have to admit. Check king f4. Now, um, 
Rook D1, here the engine says this would have made a real significant difference, would have been a lot more easily winning. Um, instead, he took the pawn, and okay, but he's still an exchange up, and it's it's ultimately enough to win. Just takes a little time. But as I said, this guy's a technician, so he gets into the technical phase. He's he's happy, doesn't care how long it takes. He's just taking his time. And eventually he gets his rooks in. Rook H three and he resigned because either trade or the H pawn drops and you know White has no counterplay. So nice win for Prague Nanda. Uh, he scored his uh, Second Grandmaster Norm, and I think he has a few months left to try to break the all-time record for youngest GM. I believe it's Karyakin holds the record, uh, 12 and I don't know how many months. But uh, this is a kid to watch. I mean, there's a lot of talented young players out there, but the fact that he's only 12 is really pretty amazing. All right, some good news in the girls section where American Jennifer Yu snagged a bronze medal with 8 out of 11. Jennifer had a chance for gold if she could have defeated the leader, Jansaya Abdumalik of Kazakhstan, in the last round. Jennifer rightly turned down a draw because, what the heck, go for the gold, right? But she lost the game in the end to finish third. And Abdumalik, who early in the year showed a very strong finish in the World Open, won with 9.5 at 11. Pretty big score. Uh Jennifer still made an I am norm. I think she'd clinched it before the last round because you just have to make it at some point from nine round nine on, and then you can register it. Um, Cause I think her performance slightly into 2450 after the last round, but uh, pretty good. And again, you know, when I played in the overall, the open um, junior championship, you know, back in the eighties, you, you couldn't even play enough players, enough IMs to make an IM norm, but now you can do it in the in the in the girls event. So I think that's re- some real progress. Now Jennifer's favorite game, and I think mine too, came in round six, a win over Zhu Jenner of China. Let's take a look at that one. Okay, now Jennifer I think was seated thirteenth in the in the event, so obviously she was one of the better players, but still a, g- a real good achievement getting in the medals. And I, I think she just picked up the this modern for the, the event, doesn't normally play it, and she plays a very unusual line. Uh, you know, I think that White can just take this pawn and uh, defend with bishop c4, and Black might ultimately get that pawn, bring the knight around to b6 and take that pawn. But, uh, you know, white, white is a very comfortable position, a, a nice edge, not, not necessarily a huge edge. But, um, you know, maybe it's not the type of position that, uh, that uh, White likes, and she plays e5. And now, most of the games Black has played c5 from this position, but Jennifer plays f6. I'm not, not sure that that move is, is any inferior, it's just been played less often. And it seems that f4 is a natural response, then we can see something like knight h6. And this resembles a Gurganitsa system, which is a, a, an opening I've played a number of times for black, but usually there there's a pawn on c6 to get this position. And well, black might save a tempo by not having having had to, to spend a move on that. And from the analysis I've done in this opening, I think that maybe can actually make a, a real difference. Black can always do that later. But it um, seems slightly strange to me to take on f6 and help Black's development. White was hoping to clamp down on this e5 square, but the problem is she expends a lot of moves to, to just try to cover squares f3, which doesn't actually prevent knight e4. Even knight e4 is not a bad move here. Um, but a non-developing move, slightly weakening move, in a sharp position, it usually gets in trouble. So Jennifer plays c5. This is a perfectly good move. Takes knight c6, queen d2. And that queen a5 probably a little bit inexact. It seems that bishop e6 is stronger. Why bishop e6? Well, really just to cover the diagonal because black is getting ready to push d4. For instance, if white castles, that might be too dangerous after d4. 
black has a lot of counterplay. So she played queen a5, which is not necessarily bad, but after knight b5, after this queen trade, uh, I think white is a little bit better off than before, just to normalize the position. Um, I know it's a fairly even game. White grabs the bishop pair. So white finally develops a kingside piece, but um, she's going to be a little bit tardy with the rest of them. Bishop b6. Now, interesting moment. Black can play rook c7 and is perfectly fine in that position, but uh, Jennifer Yu makes a bold exchange sacrifice. And I like that because, you know, I think, you know, in, in my work with students, even the very talented ones, so often it just is hard for them to pull the trigger on the exchange sacrifices because that material just seems so much larger than a pawn. Uh, but here, black has a lot of activity, and uh, Jennifer, you know, decided to go with that. And I think that the player with the initiative is usually going to be the successful one. So it's it's a good practical strategy. All right, white has various ways to try to defend, but in any case, black has sufficient counter, uh, compensation. All right, computer here suggests rook takes d3 and king d2, and now black could play. I'm not sure if black sh should wants the bishop on h6 or not. Let's say bishop h6. Also, rook c2 is possible. And then rook c1. Okay. So my engine, I didn't I didn't run it for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. But f at first it was saying g3 equals. Well, but if, you know, you're a human being, you get to a position like this and you think that, you know, I, I may never get that knight in the rook out. Might end up losing a piece. Uh, white is up two pawns, but maybe black can just bring the king in, and I don't know. It's certainly an unpleasant position for white. Uh, it's not. It's not a normal equality like the computer says. So uh, I, I certainly don't blame um, Jules Genere for not playing that. So king f1, bishop d4. Now this is one of those positions. It really looks pretty terrible for white, actually. Um, but the computer suggests that after rook b1, there's still chances to hang on. And if black plays something like rook c2, uh, h4, and you can try to bring the rook out that way. And, okay, white at least is holding on to the exchange and, you know, defending for the moment. Uh, if knight takes b2, then rook c1 activates the white rook. So rook d2 is natural move to guard the second rank. The problem is you, you she just get, gets kicked off of it. Maybe there's time pressure. I don't know. And uh, if the rook goes back to d1, black can play knight f2, forking and taking one of them. So white ends up giving up the exchange, uh, but in a less favorable way. The knight gets a c3, but bishop c1 is a killer. You know, and white. The knight, on, the knight gets undermined, and the pawn is not really well blocked. Bishop d4 prevents the king from getting in. The king has to go to the side. Bishop e3, dominating. Uh, white doesn't want to let black get an f4 check and s cement that bishop. But uh, now the pawn is too strong. D, d2, and that's all she wrote. White... White uh, resigned uh, because, you know, rook, rook uh, c1 is coming. Um, if, if rook d1, uh, this, this is interesting. I, I don't think, I'm not sure that black should play rook c1. And I, I think black is probably happier being up an exchange than being up a piece, actually, uh, and would take the rook. But, but even if black plays something like rook c4, because knight d4, there's... Um, there's, um, you know, rook d4 pinning, and a lot of times black could, you know, simplify into a winning pawn ending, you know, this is what I always love. Uh, but, it, you know, probably in a practical game, you just go rook c1, rook d2, and take the rook, and then win the a pawn, and, and so on. Obviously, it's a winning position for black. So, black is victorious in the game, Shu Yu. <laughs> All right, so well done, Jennifer, bringing home the hardware from the world world junior got some very talented young players and uh, that's always a you know, very interesting tournament to watch both on the on the 
overall what would often called the boys, but the uh, the open section and the and the girls section. So good stuff. Uh, pretty busy week. A lot of stuff to report on, and uh, I hope that was uh, very interesting and informative for all of you. I'm Grandmaster Joel Benjamin. Um, I, I hope you like that one, and I hope that you will also join me next time on GM Joel's Chess Week Recap on ICC. <laughs>